evolution cannot account for the fact of Jesus Christ. Man is no accident or sport of natural, inanimate forces pressing upwards from the womb of nothingness. He is the crowning point of creation, unique, unexampled, without counterpart in the whole of the vast universe, and the destiny of the entire universe is hinged upon his fate. The Bible assures us that the purpose of creation is worked out nowhere else but on our own planet. It is here that the great drama of God's life is unfolded, the moral law is tested, the righteousness of God vindicated, and eternal wisdom unrolled in the majestic acts of redemption and incarnation. Man the Key to Creation Man is a moral ruin fundamentally war with his God, and his prime need is redemption. Man is the only creature in visible creation who has gone down in the scale of being. Mentally and physically, he is the phenomenon of creation. The unique, the unparalleled miracle of nature, only to be accounted for as he is the special creation of God embodying within himself the meaning and the ultimate purpose of this vast and glorious universe. There are no other men. No space probe will ever find another race of men. Man has been placed alone on this earth as the unparalleled and unique crown of all being. The universe has been designed in all its illimitable greatness to give exercise to the mind of man, which is greater than his own environment. A creature, he, of two worlds. One of time, and the other of eternity. He is soul and body, created imperishable, destined for immortality, doomed to live in eternal happiness or in everlasting shame and contempt. Man is greater than the natural creation because he will outlast it. His godlike origin is seen even beyond his present degradation through sin. Genius rises from the slums. Newton's parents were nine entities. Beethoven's mother was a poor consumptive, and his father a drunkard. Man was, from the beginning, not a brute-like creature slowly and painfully arising from the primeval waste. Along human history, man has proved he can pass, in one generation, from savagery to the highest point of intellectual achievement. Sons of the Bushmen are graduating in Australian universities. The Red Indian goes straight from the wigwam to the campus, as the Kafir and the Zulu from the kraal to the research bench. All that man need is opportunity. Otherwise there are no truly backward races. It is in his own spiritual nature the highest part of him, that man is a failure. Immorality, vice, greed, avarice, dishonesty, do not spare even the greatest of men. Kings have lost their thrones because of weakness for wine and women. Popes have been the worst moral lepers of all. Adultery and unnatural vice stain the aristocracy more than the lower orders of society. Education and breeding are no bar against the fullest and most despicable in human nature. Cultured Germany stood aside while jack-booted brutes murdered six million unwanted fellow humans. Even the Christian comes short of his holiest desires. We long to be, 
yet cannot attain. Like an imprisoned eagle, we dash our wings against the bars. Something must come into human nature. We need another's strength, another's strong right arm. The primary needs of human nature are regeneration and resurrection. No more significant thing has ever been said of man than this. Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Evolutionary Failures to our list of evolutionary failures, we add the following three crucial tests. 1. Evolution cannot account for the soul of man. Reason, discovery, contrivance on the grand scale, reflection, will, self-consciousness, worship, poetry, music, literature, Beauty, harmony, art, faith, hope, love. Let all these testify to the nature of man's soul and elevate him far above and beyond all known creation. Souls do not evolve, they are the direct expression of the image of God. If the butterfly's wing, the peacock's tail, the spider's web, and the mysterious instinctive impulses which preserve and govern the animal creation. If these and ten thousand other things attest the finger of God in creation, let man's nobler part, conscience, speak for his creation as the favorite of heaven and loudly acclaim his divine origin and destiny as the one being in whom all the wisdom and purpose of God meet. To know good and evil, and to have in the breast a monitor which speaks for God and truth and righteousness, is beyond science, and proclaims that man is a moral creation accountable at last before a judgment seat. 2. Evolution cannot account for the present condition of man. That man is not only a sinner, but a dangerous criminal, a potential menace to the entire creation, is no longer doubted even by the atheist and the agnostic. Great statesmen have, after two world wars, affirmed that the future is dark and foreboding. Only the Bible tells us the meaning of this disaster which has happened to man. Original disobedience has plunged him into present ruin. The spiritual nature of man can only live by communion with his God, but all history attests that there has been catastrophic interruption. There is none righteous, quotes the great Apostle Paul. There is no one who understands or seeks after God. The entire race is adrift from its moorings and, with the controls off, our modern society is plunging headlong into vicious practices, violence and lawlessness are sweeping the face of the earth. Again we ask, which way evolution? 3. Evolution cannot account for the fact of Christ. There is no way of accounting for Christ except as the God-man. Here is one who was attested by prophecy uttered across the abyss of four thousand years. Man left his innocency behind in the garden, but went out armed with the promise of the coming seed who would be man's deliverer. It was this promise which created the Hebrew nation separated it from all the families of men, and sent it on its divine mission to preserve the pure knowledge of God in the world, to transmit the holy law, 
and to enshrine the promise of redemption till the time of deliverance should come. The coming Redeemer was the subject of the prophetic songs of David, which delineated as in a master portrait every significant feature of the life and mission of Christ as God become man. The sacrificial death by which Christ should effect the atonement was prefigured in Israel's ancient temple ordinances, and minutely described in Isaiah 53, as by an eyewitness at the actual crucifixion scene, though the royal prophet lived eight centuries before the event. Daniel fixed the year with the precision of a calendar, and all but named the very date when Christ would make an end of transgression and bring in everlasting righteousness. The very place of the Redeemer's birth was fixed as Bethlehem Ephrata, Micah 5, 2, while the price paid for his betrayal, and the final use of it, was told by Zechariah four centuries before, Zechariah 11, 12-13. Here, then, is the perfect man, the full flowering of humanity, and none should be surprised at the information that Jesus Christ is the intrusion of God in person into his own creation for the deliverance of man. Why should it be thought a thing incredible that God, who made man for himself as the crowning point of his wisdom should also stoop low unto suffering and death in order to raise his moral creation to the highest pinnacle of blessedness? Who but God could be qualified to take man's place and make man's cause his own? How make an atonement if one who was not both God and man should take the burden? Incarnation, Incarnation crucifixion, crucifixion, resurrection, resurrection and, exaltation and exaltation are the four keywords key to the understanding, understanding of the mystery of creation. of creation. And without these there is no understanding. All is chaos and meaningless. By this key all doors are opened wide. The fact of Christ is beyond all the insipid theorizing of evolution. The Bible is far ahead of all science. It shows man's need, above all else, for redemption. His need is not education but conversion. Man is defective in nothing but in his lost capacity for righteousness. Again, the fact of Christ shows that man's nature is in a state of ruinous fall. The evil forces which surrounded Christ bear witness to the wickedness man has acquired. No man dare, except at peril to his everlasting welfare, ignore Jesus Christ. In the weakness and misery of his depravity, in all his sordid lapses, and in his unattained longings, he needs Jesus Christ. The World Mad for Calvary The world was made for Calvary, not Calvary for the world. The key to the understanding of man's long and painful history, as well as to the meaning of the universe, is moral redemption. And in the most magnificent passage, the world has ever read or ever will read on this fascinating subject of the meaning, end and purpose of creation, a passage which establishes the full verbal inspiration of the Bible, Paul, with his pen dipped in the gold of eternity, writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, 
in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. Romans 8, 19 through 21. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Revelation 22, 20b. If I have told you about things that happen on earth and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about things of heaven? John 3.12